I would like us to pray as uh, we enter into number 17 of uh, our presentation in the Tabernacle series, that is, ye must be born again. Let us pray. Our dear Lord in heaven, thank you so much that uh, your love is so immense. There's nothing we can say about it. It is just so great. And so we surrender our hearts unto thee, Lord, that uh, you may take them and seal them for the courts above in heaven. Bless your people, bless your children, and Lord, minister unto me as I minister unto others. In Christ Jesus' name I ask of these things. Amen. Uh, and so it has been uh, an incredible journey that uh, it is coming to an end. I cannot say that uh, I'm glad it is coming to an end, but uh, I want to rejoice in uh, our Heavenly Father that uh, He can continue opening to the truth to us and um, help us to know of uh, His will and just give us the strength to be able to walk in that will. I know that uh, you are praying for me as I'm praying for you, that uh, the Lord will renew our first love in Him. You know, after a long time on this earth and as a churchian, as a nominal Christian, you get tired of things. When you see things just coming and going, things coming and going and nothing is happening. But uh, I want to reassure us that uh, Christ is at the helm of everything. Nothing is going to get him unaware and so I'm going back to the basics. I started with the basics, we traveled some journey and now I'm going that to those basics which we need to hear, which I need to hear and uh, the young children and the adults need to hear. So this presentation can be digested with the young and the old alike because it is for us all and there's no one who can claim that uh, I have reached a point in time I cannot go to the basics. In fact, it is the basics which will keep us uh, going, knowing where we are coming from and where we are going. And so I'm just glad this uh, time that uh, God can give me the breath of life to be able to speak to us. Ye must be born again. This is the famous discourse that uh, Christ had with Nicodemus. And the, you can guess where I'm going, where I'm coming from, and where I'm going. And this is within the realm of the sanctuary. This is the gist of the matter. This is the crux of everything in the sanctuary. That uh, at, after all has been said and done, after all has been said and done, the very thing that we need in our life is a rebirth. Nothing else. What we need is a rebirth in our lives. And so let us see how it takes place in the sanctuary. Now, here I have a cute, cute, cute baby. And uh, I know that uh, the baby is adorable. You, you feel like you could have the skin of that child. The eyes, the look, and the innocence. Everything about the baby, you will like it as you see it. I, I wish I could be in that state. But nonetheless, I'm a grown-up, you are a grown-up, and uh, life has to go on at the end of the day. And uh, what was like a smooth skin and those innocent eyes and just everything that concerned the baby you are seeing. At some point, Paul says that I was a child and I speak like a child. I was a child and I walk like a child. I was a child and I thought like a child. But now comes that age of maturity when you know that you have to stand up for things. When you know you have to reason out and choices have to be made. What shall you do at this present age? What shall you do? What shall I do at this present age? Ye must be born again. That is the only thing. You must come back as an adult to look like this baby. And so uh, it brings tears, but uh, I praise the Lord for everything. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
The Bible tells us that we can start a new life. We can bury the past. It's called the new birth. Jesus tells us about that in the book of John chapter 3 verses 3 to 5. And so, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And here is uh, Jesus talking to Nicodemus, a lead of the Jewish. And he says here, beginning in verse 3, Jesus said that we must be born again if we want to enter the home of the saved. But how do we start over? How do we experience this new birth? In verse 4, we are told Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? These are things that uh, startled the Israel leader that uh, he needs to be born again. And uh, the very question that Nicodemus asks Jesus is the very question that everyone needs to be asking today. How can that be? It is interesting when he asks that question, Christ tells him, the wind listeth where it will and no man knows about it but can only see the effect you cannot touch the wind like this you can just feel the effects of the wind blowing it means that there is a causative action in the thing happening in the background and so this leader of israel like unto us is asking how can it be can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And he goes further and tells him, As many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them he gave power. And so uh, it means that to be born of water and the Spirit, uh, it is uh, uh, what we call an experience of a new birth. It's like a conversion. It is like a... Uh, uh, I won't use, uh, I'm tempted to use the word incarnation, but it cannot be incarnation because uh, of some various things I know that we shall be opposed to. So a conversion must take place. And this conversion is uh, putting aside that which you think is your will and uh, accepting the will of the another. And uh, this accepting of the will of the other is not in a robotic way. And it's not as if it is um, something that uh, is forced unto anyone. Severally, we have looked at this statement that says that force is the last resort of every religion. And so what Christ does, um, he stands, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So, Christ says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And that is the book of John, chapter 12, verse 32. And the question is, have you ever felt the drawing power of Christ from the sinful life you have been or I have been in the past? When I walked in the ways of the world, did you hear this compelling power that you might leave this point and come to this point and be with the, your, your Lord and just start all over again? I know how people struggle to start all over again because they are hooked to various things. And uh, when you are hooked to various things, it is not easy. Sometimes, uh, and it's not sometimes, sin is like leprosy. Sin is a disease, and uh, in the healing crisis of a disease, those who have done medical uh, missionary work, and if even you have been in any sickness, you can feel that withdrawal symptom. 
syndrome, I mean, the withdrawal symptom from this state to this other state. And it is always felt in uh, the stage we call the crisis stage, when now actually there is the last push to make sure that the disease goes out of the system. You, you feel like this is withdrawal syn syndrome from anything. It is at that point that um, you, will you will hear the medical missionary working on the will of the person because the recovery actually depends on the will of the person. The patient can think that he or she is going to die because of that healing crisis. But that is the time that you will find the doctors and the physicians telling you to focus on the positive and in the future which is bright rather than the crisis itself and the past which has been so uh, bad unto you. And uh, in this healing crisis, that is when the power is unleashed in the body, sometimes you may find that even in that healing crisis, the good, bacterias are, uh, the good bacteria is swept away. So that uh, because humanity is uh, made of uh, a cycle of sevens, during the seven days, there is a rebirth or there is a formation of other good bacteria so that uh, this one that were affected and they were pushing the disease from the body are completely taken away. So it's a healing crisis. That is how sin is, like the leprosy disease. And uh, sometimes what you thought that it was good in your life, like a good bacteria, even it has to meet the crisis of Christ being uh, bathing you again and removing your whole lifestyle in the past. Whatever you thought it was good actually is put and lumped together with what is bad and it seems that it's being taken away because we will in our own eyes see some traits in us and think that, um, oh, this one is good. But when Christ comes to organize or reorganize your life, you find that even that which you thought it was good, he takes it away. So that self may be taken away and Christ alone may reign supreme. And so I'm glad that this can be done with the great physician. Again, we are told that um, there are two people in our lives who have knives. That is the butcher and then we have uh, Christ is having the knife. One is the knife of a physician. The other is the knife to kill, to take you into a butcher. And uh, these life issues are like a knife of a butcher. And the things that our hearts hold on, they are like a knife of a butcher. There are things that want to kill us, but Christ has a knife in his hand as the great physician. So whichever part he will cut, he is only cutting to replace it with something which is better. Think about it. Christ as a physician doing a surgery on Adam. And the surgery he's doing, he is going to take a rib out of his body and out of it make a help meet. That is the real physician with a good knife. But sometimes we go to the hospitals and you are told we shall cut off this part and you will never be able to walk again. You will never be able to use your hand again. You will never be able to see again. You will never be able to hear again a butcher's knife. But we are talking about being born again, being rebirthed again. Jesus having that knife of the physician. Not to cut, to remove, and he renders you um, um, he renders you which word can I use? Helpless. But then he gives out that which will help you. And out of uh, the rib of Adam comes a woman who will be a helpmate forever. 
and uh, even though Eve did not live up to the bill of being that helpmate, nonetheless the problem was not with the physician, it was with the Eve herself. For we are told when we surrender to that growing love and accept Jesus as our past super a personal savior, then we are born of the spirit, not by will, but by the will be done. This becomes our motto. Self must be crucified and Jesus must become leader. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you first all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Paul says that uh, he delivered unto us what he received, that Christ died for our sins, that the first step to a new life is death. But this is the part that people don't like most. For the dead, the dead has no power of his own. It means he has been, all the power that he has has been taken away. And so it will need the power of the other and even supernatural power to be able to work out something in the dead. And so people fear death so much because when you die, you can't participate in anything that is done. And so you have to rely to another to be able to do something in your unconsciousness, in your death, in that sphere. But in this death, we are told there is life. When Christ died, he brought mortality, uh, immortality to mortality. And now we can rejoice in him always. <clears throat> um, we are told after his death, what was happened? Christ, after dying for our sin, we are told that um, he was buried and that rose again. So death is nothing, death is not something so bad to think about. Death is something good because when you die, you resurrect. Think of uh, the seeds in the garden that um, if you plant it, it dies, but there is the germinating principle, the living principle that makes the seed to germinate again and um, when the seed is alone it can't profit anything but when uh, it's put in the ground and dies and resurrects then there is a multiplication of the same so this is what happens our life is made up of selfishness alone we exist as a single seed but uh, Christ comes into our life and he wants to take away the single seed, that is selfishness, so that we may not remain one, but uh, we may reproduce as even the seed is put in the ground and when it germinates, it brings forth many. So if we die of self, then we reproduce the fruit of the spirit, which has many elements but while self is still in us it is i i and i and that is what christ wants to remove from us so who dies at the end of the day who dies that is the question romans chapter 6 verses 6 to 7 <clears throat> knowing this that uh, our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not, we should not serve sin. So the old man has to go away. And for he that is dead is freed from sin. The old man is done away with. When something dies, what do we do with it? Burial happens. For new life to begin, we must bury the old life. And you can see how the garden looks so good. The seed has been put in the ground, the soil has been prepared well, and now you see how 
the the, the crops look so green and so look uh, so well and so there's the planting and you are planted in Christ you you, you are planted in him so that uh, you may rise in him and so the biblical method of baptism represents some um, death and new life we participate in his death and we participate in his new life we participate in his burial and also as we participate in his burial we participate in his resurrection so there is this a spiritual funeral and then we have the spiritual birthday so spiritual funeral and uh, spiritual birthday so the bible method of baptism represents death burial spiritual funeral but at the same time, it represents the new life, the resurrection, and the spiritual birthday. Steps to prepare for baptism. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Look at this. Believe, accepting Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So, there is the element that we must believe. Step number two. Repent, sorrow for sin and turning from sin. Uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you. Repent and be baptized one, every one of you. And then we have this third step. Obey the commandments of Jesus. Keep the commandments of Jesus. In the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 19 to 20, go ye into the world, and what are you go to go to the world to do? To teach, baptize, and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And these are the steps we are looking into that ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. And what are these steps to prepare for baptism? And uh, I, I'll go through some inspiration. Uh, I'm reminding us of these basic steps that people think that uh, they are no longer of great importance to their life because they have reached some spiritual bliss that cannot go back to those fundamental uh, basics of uh, conversion. Now, preparing young for the baptism or this new birth. Candidates who have grown to manhood and womanhood should understand their duty better than do the younger ones. But the pastor of the church has a duty to do for these souls. Have they wrong habits and practices? It is the duty of the pastor to have special meetings with them. Give them Bible readings, converse and pray with them, and plainly show the claims of the Lord upon them. Read to them the teaching of the Bible in regard to conversion. Show what is the fruit of conversion. The evidence that they love God show that true conversion is a change of heart, of thoughts and purposes. Evil habits are to be given up. The sins of evil speaking, of jealousy, of disobedience are to be put away. A warfare must be waged against every evil trait of character. Then the believing one can understandingly take to himself the promise, ask and it shall be given you. Matthew 7, 7. This is coming from Evangelism, page 311, paragraph 1. Continued on in paragraph 2, the test of discipleship is not brought to bear as closely as it should be upon those who represent, present themselves for baptism. It should be understood whether they are simply taking the name of Seventh-day Adventist or whether they are taking their stand on the Lord's side. <clears throat> To come out from the world and be separate, and to touch not the unclean thing. Before baptism, there should be a thorough inquiry as to the experience of the candidates. Let this inquiry be made, not in a cold and distant way, but kindly, tenderly, pointing the new converts to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Bring the requirements of the gospel to bear upon the candidates for baptism. Evangelism, page 312, paragraph 1. 
one of the points upon which those newly come to the faith will need instruction is the subjects of dress. Let the new converts be faithfully dealt with. Are they vain in dress? Do they cherish pride of heart? The adultery of dress is a moral disease. It must not be taken over into the new life. It, in most cases, submission to the gospel requirements will demand a decided change in the dress. Evangelism, page 312, paragraph 2. There should be no carelessness in dress. For Christ's sake, whose witness we are, we should seek to make the best of our appearance. In the tabernacle service, God specified every detail concerning the garments of those who ministered before him. Thus, we are taught that he has a preference in regard to the dress of those who, are, who serve him. Very specific were the directions given in regard to Aaron's robes, for his dress was symbolic. So the dress of Christ's followers should be symbolic. In all things, we are to be representatives of him. Our appearance in every respect should be characterized by neatness, modesty, and purity. But the word of God gives no sanction to the making of changes in apparel merely for the sake of fashion, that we may appear like the world. Christians are not to decorate the person with costly array or expensive ornaments. The words of scripture in regard to dress should be carefully considered. We need to understand that which the Lord of heaven appreciates in even the dressing of the body. All who are in earnest in seeking for the grace of Christ will heed the precious words of instruction inspired by God. Even the style of apparel will express the truth of the gospel. And all who study the life of Christ and practice his teaching will become like Christ. Their influence will be like his. They will reveal soundness of character. As they walk in the humble path of obedience, doing the will of God, they exert an influence that tells for the advancement of the cause of God and the healthful purity of his work. In these thoroughly converted souls, the world is to have a witness to the sanctifying power of truth upon the human character. The knowledge of God. The knowledge of God and uh, of Jesus Christ expressed in character is an exaltation above everything that is esteemed in earth or in heaven. It is the very highest education. It is the key that opens the portals of the heavenly city. This knowledge, it is God's purpose that all who put on Christ by baptism shall possess. And it is the duty of God's servants to set before these souls the privilege of their high calling in Christ Jesus. There is one thing that we have no right to do, and that is to judge another man's heart or impan his motives. But when a person presents himself as a candidate for church membership, we are to examine the fruit of his life and leave the responsibility of his motive with himself. But great care should be exercised in accepting members into the church, for Satan has his specious devices through which he purposes to crowd false brethren into the church, through whom he can work more successfully to weaken the cause of God. Now, those are interesting things to read. In Mark chapter, in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, we are told, He that believeth and is baptized, he that um, believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, for you to be baptized, you must believe. But uh, people come for baptism, which is a renewal and um, an outward proclamation that they are starting a new life. And uh, there is no belief in them. If uh, you would ask them this and that, and uh, you can test their lives, which is not actually testing their motives. A simple thing that... Um, would you be willing to follow Christ in this and in this way as revealed in his word? <coughs> you hear people talking of uh, others judging them, which is uh, another thing also to think about. Should I wait till I am perfect before being baptized? That is a question that is asked. But who knows who is perfect and who is not perfect if it is not God himself. But otherwise, 
the fruit shall be known the tree shall be known by its fruit and so there's another question that we should ask ourselves why is it that people don't change for better the question is what could be the problem why is it that even after the most stirring sermons have been preached people still do not leave their evil habits they acknowledge the truth uh, intellectually but deny the power thereof it is for the first time they hear the message they get moved they feel how far they have gone off the path of life but uh, let them now go home they console themselves that they are not the only ones guilty that uh, other people are also still guilty and uh, you know what they become bold in transgression because they are looking at this person and this person and uh, they are comparing their lives with the other people who profess to be Christians instead of comparing their life with Christ. And so they end up having this casual kind of conversion where Christ is not the example but other men in the church. And you hear some people say these statements over and over again. If so and so can be like this and this, then I'm better off. And uh, there is another unwise statement you hear people say, if so and so will be in heaven, then God must admit me there. Be because they think that uh, they can look up to man, measure their self with men, and then uh, at the end of the day, they can appear before God and tell him that, uh, you know what, God, if uh, somebody like Sami could get to heaven, then uh, I think I'm far better than him because his life I know better and all that stuff. This kind of thinking and uh, expressing ourselves is nothing than the voice of Satan speaking through us. Everyone should be looking unto Jesus Christ who is the author and finish of our faith. But also I want to give us this caution all of, of, of us is that uh, when you are a Christian, no one falls alone. When you do sin, there are people who are looking at you and they are discouraged very terribly because there is something they are expecting from you as a Christian. If you are righteous, it uh, really motivates others to be righteous still. You know the rules of adaptation and uh, how role model thing works out. That uh, we are either a saver of life unto life or a saver of death unto death. We, we, we don't live for self. Either we are falling, and when we fall, we fall with others. A good example is look, to look at Eve. When she falls, she doesn't fall alone. She drags Adam with him, with her. You can also look at the sons of Jacob when they try to do sin. No, no single person does sin alone. They go along with that. You drag many people with them. Look at Peter when he doubts Jesus Christ and says, I go fishing. And the other disciple says, I go fishing too. So we should be careful when we call ourselves Christians and we are surrounded with people and we don't care what uh, we are doing because we don't live for ourselves. And so let us look at this. The stages of conversion. The stages of conversion. <clears throat> One, get to know the truth. Accept it as the truth. Feeling sorry for having done wrong, confessing the wrong, and then praying for power to overcome the wrong and doing our part in resisting temptation. The fully converted man and the new man. So, let us look at in details at these steps that we are talking about. <clears throat> One, get to know what is truth. The first step to conversion is to have the ability to differentiate between right and wrong, 
The conscience must be awakened. Right and wrong must be known by us. This is what pastors are to do, to make right plain before the congregation as to leave no doubt as to what constitutes it. Right is the will of God. Wrong is that which is contrary to his will. This, is, this will is revealed in the Bible. So all that the Bible condemns is wrong must be forsaken. And uh, we must have this habit of prayerfully studying the Bible so that many uh, we may know it for ourselves. We must not depend on others. And uh, as little children, <clears throat> the Lord himself will uh, be able to teach us slowly, step by step, into that full maturity man. Because he has called us unto salvation, he will not allow false shepherds to bring their theories into our life because we have the guardian angels who guides us and they'll be able to bring the truth. Now, in uh, Proverbs chapter 2 verses 1 to 5, we are talking about knowing the truth steps to conversion. You must be born again, the basics of uh, the sanctuary message. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, if thou seeketh her as silver and searchest for her as for hidden hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And uh, we understand from Proverbs 8.13, that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. But uh, we ask ourselves, what is the problem? In, when you go to John chapter 3, verses 19 to, 20, to 21, we are told that the light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And for everyone that doeth evil hated the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made man manifest, that they are wrought in God. But people fear coming to this light, so that uh, the darkness in them may be exposed, that they may receive the light from God. And so... None is excusable from sin. The truth is a light everywhere, especially in our present world where there is great circulation of the Bible than at any time in the world history. Those who deliberately stay away from knowing the truth when they can get it will be judged as though they knew it. We must all be in pursuit of the living truth. It is the greatest work we have to do for ourselves and none will be held guiltless who does not engage in this work while he knows how to read and has the Holy Bible within reach. In Acts 13, 41, that is the first step. We have to know the truth for ourselves. Behold, ye despise us and wonder and perish. Why? Unfortunately, many just have an intellectual understanding of the truth and stop them. They are often puzzled at what it is. They look at it as one will look at a foreign object fallen on earth from Jupiter. They look at the past as religious genius, such as are considered despisers. And uh, we are told in John 17, 3 that... Uh, the eternal life is this, knowing the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. But uh, this should be an experiential um, knowledge rather than uh, uh, just an information. For we are told in, uh, is it in 2 Peter chapter 1 that uh, uh, I'll refer to it quickly because I have my Bible with me. Uh, the book of Second uh, Peter chapter 1 and 2, not First Peter. Second Peter chapter 1 and 2. It says this. Simon Peter, servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So he says that... Uh, in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they may know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou have sent. But then in 2 Peter 
uh, chapter 1 verse 2 we are told that peace and grace be multiplied by the knowledge of John 17 3. So when a person gets intimate with the Father and the Son, the grace, the peace, peace that is promised in John 14 27 is multiplied and the grace that is talked of in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and Titus 2, 11 is given unto him. And that grace is the grace to overcome sin, the unmerited power to live a righteous life. That is what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1. That we who have obtained the like same precious faith through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so grace and peace is multiplied when we have a knowledge of the Father and a knowledge of the Son. So we must know the truth for ourselves. The second step in our conversion is accepting the truth. After knowing this truth, accept it. The truth must not only be understood, it must be accepted, it must be cherished, it must not be sold for any tinsel that may appear to look like it. But what do most people do even after receiving the truth? Let us see what the Bible says. In Jeremiah 8, 5 to 6, Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit, they refuse to return. I hearken and I heart, but they speak not aright. No man repenteth of him, of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his cause as the horse rushes into the battle. They knew the truth, but then they wouldn't accept it as the truth. But those that love God accept the truth and consider that they have transgressed against God. They do not hide their sins in the vain philosophies of men, the rudiments of human philosophy. In Psalms 32, 8, I'll instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I'll guide thee with mine eye. Be not as the horse or as the mule, which have not understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridled, lest they come near unto thee. After getting to know the truth and having accepted it, a conviction is aroused in the heart of the evil that we have for so long delighted in unknowingly. A need is created to make peace with God. Forgiveness is sought for earnestly. And we are told in 1 John chapter 1, if we say we do not have sin, we make him a liar. But if we confess, he is able to forgive us of our iniquities. So, step number three, confessing the wrong. I hearken and heard, Jeremiah laments, but they speak not aright. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Romans chapter 10, verse 10, we, we, we find that for with the heart the man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. We cannot be forgiven and make a step of faith without confessing the wrong things that we do or we have been involved in. Jeremiah 3.13, I only acknowledge thy iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not enjoyed uh, my voice, said the Lord. I acknowledge my sin. David says, after sinning with Bathsheba, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I'll confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee. In a time when thou mayest be found, surely in the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto him. But many having resisted the truth see absolute, absolutely no need to confess their sins before God. They continue in the path of error because they had rejected the light. To them sin is no more sin but righteousness. They love it, they indulge in it, they cherish it. To resist it never even flashes in their mind. They are on the death lane, cruising to their eternal destruction. It is with a thrill that they go to death and are so drunk with it that they cannot resist temptation. They are drowsy till the day they shall awake in hell when real death knocks at their lives. Step number four, resist the temptation. We always pray that lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil. But the real resisting of the temptation is not putting yourself in an environment which will lead you to sin or which will uh, remove the protection of the holy angels. So after confession, one prays for strength to overcome temptation and sin. 
we have the devil to resist and temptation to overcome. And then we choose who will reign in our heart. This involves a deliberate effort to stay away from tempting situations and a fervent prayer to overcome whenever one comes our way. We are not machines. We are free human beings with a will to exercise. No temptation that comes to anyone is too strong for him to overcome. We therefore can live a victorious life over sin. And so in James 1.12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. James 4, 7. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that he may be able to bear it. And so, in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 4, we are told that we have never resisted. We have not yet resisted <clears throat> unto blood, striving against sin. You can ask that Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. The fifth step, the new man. And we are told, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, John 1, 12. To receive Christ is to receive the word of God which is in the Bible. Revelation 19, 13, it is to receive that word holy and apply it in your daily life. It is being baptized in him. This is the baptism of the Spirit. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ Walk ye in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh therein. Uh, Galatians 2.20, where <clears throat> we find the famous text that time. Uh, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, the life I live is the life of Christ. It is not me that liveth, says Paul. And so... It is walking in the light as you receive it. While ye have light, believe in the light that ye may be children of light. John 12, 36. All are God's creation. Only those that are led by the Holy Spirit, only those that walk in the light of the Bible are God's children. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. The sixth step. Where could be the problem? Many people do what? Go to the church but only for what to do they are not given to the living god few christians study the bible and few of those do it daily few of the few study diligently and yet few of the few pay keen attention to what they read they read to confirm what they already believe not to get what god has for them they are prejudiced many understand the truth when spoken and that is the farthest they are willing to go let us some become brave to mock the truth once received and so, of the few who accept the truth, few hold fast to them till the end, but only intellectually. The rest become corrupted somewhere along the way. Of the few who receive the truth, few, a lot many few, ever feel remorse for the sins they have committed. This is where the major problem is. The majority wonder at the truth and soon will perish. Their consciences are dead and is, really, and is hardly awakened from spiritual stupor. They learn but never come to the living truth of the truth. They do not confess of their exposed sin. And uh, you can let, get that in the parable of the sower. Very interesting things to read there. So, uh, what is Christ really wanting to teach us? What is Christ wanting to teach us? And uh, let us go through some few statements here. What does Christ want to do for us? In uh, Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19 to 20. And I'll give them one heart, and I'll put a new spirit within you, and I'll take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a, a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. And they shall be my people, and I'll be their God. Ezekiel 11, 19 to 20. A new heart also I'll give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I, and I give you a heart of flesh. 
and I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Ezekiel 36 verse 26 and 27. And so here we get uh, the message of justification there. That uh, we come as we are. We receive pardon and pardon is the same as justification. And then we walk in the newness of life. This is the very precious message that the Lord ordained it should be the third angel's message, justification by faith. Receiving Christ and in TM page 91 and 92, quoted also in DM, these are the very good things that we read in this uh, beautiful message. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I have answered. It is the third angel's message in verity. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagoner and Jonas. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the afflicted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the world, whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the Spirit in a large measure. TM 91-92 The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel. The last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. And so, let everyone who claims to be to believe that the Lord is soon coming, such the scriptures as never before. For Satan is determined to try every device possible to keep souls in darkness and blind mind to the perils of the times in which we are living in. He would not want people to appropriate the righteousness of Christ in their lives. He wants them to be caught in darkness. We must search the truth for ourselves. We must fill our minds with the things that ennoble. And the things that pollute must be left aside. And so, we must come to a point that uh, every known sin must be uh, overcome. And uh, let us call point upon point what has been revealed and then ask the Lord who has revealed that point to give us the strength to be overcomers. The, the, the reason why we're having a lot of problems is that many have lost sight of Christ as it is written in TM 91 and 92. And... Uh, Right now, the people need to be aroused from their stupor and slumber and be pointed or directed to the divine person of Jesus Christ and his merits and his changeless love for the human family. Because he says that all power is given in my hands that he may dispense with the rich gifts unto men, imparting that priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. We must be born again. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message in verity, righteousness by faith. You know, when we are talking about the third angel's message, we are so concerned with the beast and the wound of the beast that was healed. The, the beast whose wound, who received the mortal wound and then it was healed. And then we focus so much on the second beast which brings life to the image of the beast. And we think that this is the package of the third angel's message that has to go to the whole world. No, the gospel of this kingdom shall go forth to the whole world as a witness. Then, then, then there is when the end shall come. The glory of God has to uh, uh, cover the whole earth according to Isaiah chapter 60, I presume, 
in uh, Revelation chapter 18. And so, is that Isaiah 61? Arise and shine for the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. That is, um, yes, uh, Isaiah chapter 60, not 61. Arise and shine for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. As I was saying in the previous presentation, that uh, the revelation of the character precedes the proclamation of the message itself. So, the message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God which closes the work of the third angel's message. And uh, we get that in uh, LDE, page 200, paragraph 3. The righteousness of Jesus Christ has to shine in uh, our life. And so, look at this as uh, we try to wrap up this. As the third message swells to a loud cry and as a great power and glory attend the closing work, the faithful people of God will partake of that glory. It is the latter rain which revives and strengthens them to pass through the time of trouble. As the end approaches, the testimonies of God's servant will become more decided and more powerful. This message of Revelation 14, 9 to 12 embraces the two preceding messages. It is represented as being given with a loud voice that is, with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we are looking forward to the message as foretold in the 18th chapter of Revelation. When it will be proclaimed with great power because the righteousness of Christ will be our rear guard or our, our rear reward. And so I'm looking at what Christ is doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary. And uh, my prayer is that uh, we may participate in this cleansing. Because when you read uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, it says that whoever is born of God, we were told we must be born again of the water and the spirit. And so in 1 John 3, 9, we are told that whoever is born of God doth not commit sin. That means that he is not in habitual sinning. That is sinning and repenting. Non-sins. For his seed, the seed of Christ remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And if any man be in Christ, the old things have gone, behold, the new ones have come. And so, we should be working on the cleansing of uh, our soul temple. We should be working on the cleansing of our soul temple so that... Uh, the righteousness within may not be held in check with this transparent flesh. I, I just thought to use those words because uh, we are told that uh, when Christ was here on earth, his divinity flashed through his transparent flesh and then the whole the, the whole nation of Israel and the Pharisees and those who are assembled before him, they categorically knew that this was the Son of God. Now, when we are filled with the fruit of the Spirit, when we are filled with the righteousness of Jesus Christ in our hearts, the righteousness within cannot be contained there, but it will blow out this transparent flesh and show forth, and then the people will... Uh, uh, will be able to give to glory to our Father which is in heaven. Remember the story of Moses when he had been with the, the Lord in the mount for 40 days. And he came from that. And then his whole face was shining. His whole body was glorious. Because he had meditated upon the word of God. And then uh, the righteousness within shone uh, outside. And the people could not endure that light. This is the kind of life that uh, people must come into possession with. And uh, what maybe we can say we are lacking is the power. But why should we lack the power when Christ has given us, when he says that uh, all power has been given unto us? 
in the book of uh, Romans chapter 5. In the book of Romans chapter 5, as we close this. We are looking at, you must be born again. Romans chapter 5, as uh, we close. Verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And uh, when he did that, then he gave us the power to be able to be overcomers. Just as he overcame, so his victory is our victory. I pray that uh, in this day, we may accept this new birth and die with Christ and start walking in newness of life, lest it be too late. Christ is still interceding in this heavenly sanctuary. No one knows when their name will be called. It is uh, a fearful thing to profess Christianity and when your name is called in the sanctuary above, you are found like that man who came to the wedding without a wedding garment. He came on his terms like Abel came before the presence, like Cain came before the presence of God with, him, with his own terms. The garment has been given unto us. It has been procured by the death of Jesus Christ. Now he tells us, let us die with him that we may resurrect with him. And when we resurrect with him, he gives us that glorious garment because we understand that Christ was resurrected by the glory of the Father. And so if we die with Christ, we are resurrected with the same glory that resurrected him. That is the glory of the Father. And the righteousness which we need is hidden in that glory. For we can only approach him if we have that same Shekinah glory. It is the spirit which manifests itself as the glory of the Father. And so if we have that spirit, then we shall have the glory of the Father. That is why Christ tells Nicodemus, you must be born of water and you must be born of the Spirit. Water to show that you are entering into a new stage in your life and you are telling the whole world that you do not longer belong to them. By the Spirit, a change in the heart, a reception of the gift, and entering into the service of the Lord. This is what it means to be born again. And I pray that we shall be born again. Shall we? of a, a word of prayer. Gracious are thy ways, Heavenly Father, and whoever follows them shall never be lost. We say, whoever cometh unto thee, you shall not cast him away. And so we rejoice that uh, although we are like lost sheep who do not return home, there is always this drawing power which is so powerful and magnetic that, Lord, it draws us home and we can hear the voice of the shepherd. And when the sheep hears the voice of the shepherd, he follows that shepherd. Thank you for sending your son and thank you for the truth that he has revealed unto us. And not only revealing the truth, but dying for our sins that we may have newness of life. May these merits of his blood speak to our lives in a better way that uh, we may be saved from the condemnation of sinning and repenting. And so thank you for answering our prayers. For we pray believing in Jesus' name. Amen.